welcome as we gather to worship the Lord. And Lord, please stand for the reading of the word this morning. This morning's reading comes from Psalm 99. The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He dwells between the cherubim. Let the earth be moved. The Lord is great in Zion, and he is high above all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. He is holy. Amen.
Please be seated. Okay, we good? Maybe. Um, you know, we say it all the time, especially lately, right? Uh, but it's true. We are living in strange times. You know, things are just odd. Um, not only is our current pandemic just a strange situation, but life in general is a little strange these days. And we've talked about this a lot at length. It seems that things have just been turned on their head, right? Uh, we, we call um, right wrong and wrong right. Um, there's just no, no sense of um, authority in any of our lives anymore. You know, we're unwilling to, to be under submission of anyone, let alone God. Um, you know, the mantra of the day is basically the individual rules. And whatever works for you... Um, that's what you need to focus on. Uh, one thing that we do need to pay attention to is where do people turn in times of trouble? Many people might turn to hobbies, sports, golf, or gardening, knitting, stamping. Others might turn to a vice like drinking. Religious folk generally turn to their god or gods, whatever they might believe, or some kind of vague spirituality that's that's popular today. Uh, We sometimes lose sight of the fact that there are actual people living amongst us that do worship other gods. It's a reality. And we just are kind of blinded to it. But yet it still goes on around us. We might actually be tempted to buy into the mantra uh, whatever works for you, right? Whatever floats your boat. But it's important for us to recognize that God's word for us today applies to them. In last week's passage, which was the beginning of Isaiah 41, we saw really what was a courtroom scene. We saw God summoning the nations to present their case before him. This really continues today. Uh, We're picking it up in chapter 41, starting at verse 21. Present your case, says the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons, says the king of Jacob. Let them bring forth and show us what will happen. Let them show the former things, what they were, that we may consider them and know the latter end of them, or to declare to us the things to come. Show the things that are to come hereafter, that we may know that you are gods. Yes, do good or do evil, that we may be dismayed and see it together. Now this is one of those, it's kind of an interesting kind of passage, right? We today think of, you know, we've touched on it a lot, but we think of God as this kind of lovey-dovey, benevolent creature who only wants good and and would never speak ill of anybody because he just loves everybody so much. But here we see him, you know, calling the nations before him, and he's mocking their gods, just mocking them. Basically tell us, where are your prophets? Where are the ones who who in the past predicted what was going to come? Where are the ones that are going to today declare what's going to come in the future? And then he kind of gets to this point, is actually just do anything, good or evil. Do something. Prove your godhood. In verse 24, his conclusion, Indeed, you are nothing, and your work is nothing. He who chooses you is an abomination. Now, that last line is one that sometimes I think is hard for us to swallow today. He's basically saying the person that chooses you as a god is an abomination. 
Who does that apply to in our own lives? Your loved one, the well-meaning kind of person who's into kind of earth love, nice people, an abomination. Your loved ones who uh, have followed after some kind of splinter group that started as, as Christianity, someone maybe like the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons, following after false gods, the scripture tells us they are an abomination. We might like to think that in the end, God is going to save everyone, but the reality is they're worshiping a false god, and that brings judgment on them. Verse 25. I have raised up one from the north, and he shall come. From the rising of the sun, he shall call on my name, and he shall come against princes as though mortar. As the potter treads clay, who has declared from the beginning that we may know? And the former times that we may say he is righteous. Surely there is no one who shows. Surely there is no one who declares. Surely there is no one who hears your words. I actually love the way the the Christian Standard Bible translates that last uh, few verses. It says, no one announced it, no one told it, no one heard your words. Verse 27, the first time I said to Zion, look, there they are, and I will give to Jerusalem one who brings good tidings. For I looked, and there was no man. I looked among them, but there was no counselor. Who, when I asked of them, could answer a word? Indeed, they are all worthless. Their works are nothing. Their molded images are wind and confusion. This chapter ends much in the same way it began with allusions to Cyrus, the king of Persia, who was God's agent to rescue God's people. He's the one who he speaks of, the one that's going to come from the north. This fact, you know, God has answered really his own questions. Who among you is going to come tell us the future? Who is going to decipher the past? But then he says, I told my people this one from the north is going to come and when you see it, it basically proves God is who he says he is. Cyrus is presented as God's servant and this shows up elsewhere in the Bible. In the book of Ezra, we find find these words. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth the Lord God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. We had said last week that really, especially people during that time, they were a lot more kind of spiritual than we were. And they tended to attribute everything that happened throughout their lives to the gods. And the nations that were in power thought that it was because their god was superior to the nations that they'd conquered. So Babylon and even some of the Persians, you know, in that area, they worshipped the god Marduk. So Babylon thought they're in power because Marduk is greater than Yahweh. That's their thinking. But God is saying, no, you know, through all this, I'm the one who's in charge. And God then uses Cyrus as his agent to to see his will come to be. One of the problems that we have, I think, connecting with passages like this is that we don't see idolatry take place in the same way that they did. You know, today, religion, even spirituality, does not have the same place in public life that it has really for most of the world throughout history. Therefore, it's easy to go through life, never really encounter the spiritual practices of people that we might call friends. 
you know, coworkers that we work with for a long time, we could have no clue where they stand on a whole host of issues. Whereas in times past, you couldn't hide it. Because commerce in most of these cities surrounded around your religion. Buying and selling of trinkets and idols, uh, the giving of, of uh, sacrifices to your gods, partaking in religious ceremonies time and time again. Today, life has become very kind of fragmented, very compartmentalized. So we all can tuck away our religious side and live out the rest of our lives in front of everybody and keep our spirituality private. So when the people that we know and love are guilty of idolatry, we don't see it. Really, you ask yourself, what is an idol? Well, in, especially in the Old Testament sense, an idol is literally a physical statue or thing that is carved or fashioned to represent a deity. And it's something that for many people, and even in some places in the world today, they think that the deity actually indwells that item. So that when you're praying to it, you're actually praying to this god. So I think one of the best modern-day examples that most people can relate to is Buddha. I think in this country, one of, one of the good examples of that is you have Buddhists in this country, and they, they will have a statue of Buddha in their home. They'll pray to it. They'll feed it. Buddhists will actually put food on a plate, present it to their god, so that he can eat in, in the afterlife. But the reality is that the ancient Hebrews lived in a world filled with idols. Think back to their time in Egypt. You know, Egyptians represented their deities in various human animal forms. Similarly, uh, various of the Mesopotamian cultures used idol representations of their deities, just like the Hittites did, just like the Canaanites did. One of the prominent distinguishing features that Christianity has, and really even the uh, worship of God uh, in all time, is that it was image-less. God actually commanded, you're, you're not going to make an image after me. Think back to Exodus 20. He says, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth below or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. And if we think about this and our tendency to disobey this, it was a huge problem for the Israelites. I mean, as Moses is on the mountain receiving these words from God, what are the people doing at the foot of the mountain? They're making a golden calf. An act that would then lead to God's judgment on them. So if you remember, what did Moses do? Melt down that calf and everybody had to drink it. Idolatry, in a very real sense, is about giving worship to a man-made thing. Carved image, statue, painting, which represents that deity. This is why idolatry, the idea of idolatry, is hard for us to pinpoint, especially in America. We don't see people doing this. We don't see people bowing to statues in their homes, which makes it hard to spot. And it also makes it hard for us to identify. And we kind of have to be careful in how we address it. Uh, We can go too far and label everything idolatry, right? Right? And that's not necessarily the case. You see, you can have someone who loves the Lord dearly, but struggles with indwelling sin, right? It's not necessarily because of idolatry. It's because we're not perfected yet. So we want to be careful that we don't label everything idolatry. Because you can cast an undue weight on someone that they already feel. They're already trying to overcome But today we do have what some people might call figurative idolatry. 
This kind of idolatry doesn't physically worship false idols, but it's the kind of idolatry that desires things above God. The Apostle Paul warns us about these things in many places throughout his letters, but I want to focus quickly on Colossians 3.5 where he writes these words, he says, therefore, he's talking about really the new life, right? You're a new man in Christ. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Now, we may not see people physically bowing down to idols, but how many people are struggling with covetousness? I do. Guarantee your neighbor does. How often do we see things that other people have, whether they be physical, whether they be jobs, positions, wealth, and we desire that? It's really desiring something that someone else has and not being content with what God has blessed you with. So, for example, here's a perfect one. Men in their tools right? You can have all the tools you need to get the job done, but when your neighbor comes home with the newest version of that drill, it's got a smaller battery, longer life, and more power, oh, I want that, right? I want that. My drill works fine, but it's old, you know, it's getting kind of banged up, and batteries are expensive. We can justify that. I need the new and shiny. Then we get the new and shiny, and it satisfies us for a short time, but not for long, right? Men, we tend to struggle with this in areas like that. Tools, cars, our jobs. Women, I think one of the biggest areas that you struggle with this today is in the idea of the Insta family. For many of you who aren't on social media, the Insta family is the perfect family. It's a lady that spends half a day crafting the perfect picture to make you think her life is just awesome. When we all know it's not the case, but yet you feel that pressure. You want to live up to it. I want what she's got, right? The other way that I know in our family we talk about it is you you look online and everybody's out there making memories. And if you're not out making memories, you must be a bad mother. So we want that. We struggle with that. We desire what they have, even though what they have is really just an illusion. I think the other way that, you know, especially... Women, but more and more men, you struggle with this with accepting who we are physically, right? We see the way the world wants us to look, and we want that. How many people then shape and change their life to pursue that image that they think they need to have? Well, that's a form of idolatry. You're desiring something kind of outside of God. You're not happy with what he's given you. And it can become all-consuming. You know, us men, we're pretty stupid, okay? Um, in spite of what, what even, even, even very secular and liberal you know, sociologists would tell us, um, women really, by and large, aren't going to make a decision on their mate based on how you look. Sure, they want someone attractive, but that's really all it takes. They don't need you to be a hunk. Because most of them know that in order to maintain that, you're going to spend your life in the gym and not with me. But yet us dumb men think, well, i got to have that. And that's an example of how we can set this up as an idol, work hard to achieve it, and in the end, what's it worth? Idolatry can also express itself in benign or even good things that take over our lives. Being that this is Memorial Day weekend, I want to talk a little bit about how this can manifest itself in the form of patriotism. Because it's true. There's a form of patriotism that becomes idolatry. First, I want to say, and as I said before, Memorial Day is a great and solemn holiday. It's fitting to honor those who have given their life in defense of this nation. I actually think that to be a good citizen of America, you must take time to reflect on that. 
That's why this day is set aside. Take time to reflect on those things. Give God thanks for it. Because the fact is the work ethic, the pride, the loyalty of neighbor that made this nation the greatest nation ever is dying if it's not already dead. So holidays like this, I think, are necessary to remind us because we are a forgetful people. We should fight to uphold these values and everything that all the men and women who gave their lives in defense of this nation fought for. Otherwise, we are at risk of allowing them to die in vain. But like anything, we also need to evaluate our patriotism in light of Scripture. And unfortunately, many well-meaning Christians conflate the two. Here's the way it tends to kind of be lived out. Not always. And if this fits you, I'm not picking on you. I didn't know that, you know, it was going to be a thing for you, Bill, but it's okay. (laughs) There's a form of conservatism where people do believe God. They worship him. They're morally conservative. They're politically conservative. But they think that all these things are necessary in order to call yourself a Christian. They may even go so far as to evaluate the genuineness of someone else's claim to Christianity by how they might vote. These are categories the Bible doesn't give us. They're extra biblical. They may say something like, I don't know how anyone can call themselves a Christian and vote Democrat. Might be your opinion, but is it gospel? Does it come from the word of God? They probably spend most of their week listening to Rush, watching Hannity. Maybe it's Ben Shapiro, Glenn Beck, fill in the blank with whoever your favorite conservative talk show host is. For many of you, you might hear this and say, well, it's about time you call out these self-righteous folks. Tired of hearing this. But the reality is there's another side of the coin, too. For others, on the other side of things, you may not like these talking heads, but you've got your own set of talking heads. And you may spend every week waiting for the next social injustice to decry, to speak out against. And then you spend the rest of that week putting down anyone who disagrees with your viewpoint. These folks are not at risk of allowing patriotism to become an idol because they're too busy being offended by everything they hear. They're constantly looking for new ways to claim victimhood and then cancel anyone who disagrees. In both of these situations, we have people calling themselves Christians, but they spend most of their time completely ignoring God in favor of other things. The political process today is its own religion. And it's got its own evangelists. It's got its own way to salvation. And it's taking over the minds of people in this country. It is a form of modern day idolatry where we desire something more than God. Take God off his rightful place as ruler over our lives. Place something else in that sacred place. What's the danger in all of this? Anything we put in God's place can actually... The problem is that it can actually bring us temporary satisfaction. It can give us temporary meaning. It can give us purpose for life in a short time. But it cannot satisfy our deepest longings. In the deserts of central Australia, there's a plant that grows called nardu. It's kind of like a fern, and the natives there will eat it from time to time. It's completely edible. If they can't find anything else, they'll eat it. One of the problems with this plant, though, is it tastes very good, but it has no nourishment value. So it can satisfy your hunger, but it's not feeding your body. One time, a party of explorers were crossing the central desert and ran out of food, came across this plant. They knew the natives ate it, so they started eating it. Thinking they were being filled and they were going to be okay, it actually became their demise. They wasted away and led down and died of starvation. A solitary survivor was discovered under a tree, and he's the one that told their story. That Nardu 
really can substitute anything we put in place of God. We can find lots of things that give us value and meaning in life. Lots of things. Even good things like patriotism. It can give us great meaning, give us community, a purpose for living. But at the end of our life, what has it gotten us? If we use it to displace God on his place as king over our lives. So what's the answer to this? Well, I think four things. First, we who identify as followers of Christ ought to be very patriotic. Don't misunderstand me. We ought to be very patriotic. We actually ought to be the best citizens of this nation. By God's grace, we've been fortunate enough to live in this great nation. We have in our founding documents what some consider the greatest man-made documents ever. Only because of the wisdom of our founding fathers, and for many of them it was God-fearing wisdom, has our republic stood the test of time. If it's going to continue, it's going to be because good men and women stand up and fight for it. Second, especially today, though, we need to understand that the things that the prophet Isaiah has said about the nations are true of America. Okay? God is sovereign over history. God is sovereign over nations. He raises up rulers. He decides their times, their spans, how they're going to rise to power, and ultimately how they're going to fall. That is true of America. And we can get so wrapped up in fighting for America and our rights that we lose sight of the fact that God is the one on the throne. We read this a couple weeks ago at the beginning of chapter 40. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, measured heaven with a span, and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure, weighed the mountains in scales, and the hills in a balance? Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord? or as his counselor has taught him. With whom did he take counsel, and who instructed him and taught him in the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are as a drop in the bucket and are counted as the small dust on the scales. Look, he lifts up the isles as a very little thing. And Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor its beasts sufficient for a burnt offering. All the nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted by him less than nothing and worthless. That's true of this great nation. If God tarries, if Jesus tarries long enough, there will be a day when this nation, as we know it, is either altered so much that it doesn't resemble its founding or is completely gone. History should have taught us that much. We don't need scripture to know that. History has shown us that. God is not dependent on America to fulfill his purposes. Third, Know the condition of the human heart. Know the condition of your heart. Prophet Jeremiah tells us that the human heart is wicked, that it can't be trusted. Society wants us to believe that your heart is a source of truth, and it's what you need to follow all the time. Great theologian John Calvin said, the human mind is, so to speak, a perpetual forge of idols. It's an idol factory. He went on also to say, every one of us is even from his mother's womb an expert at inventing idols. If you think of the the words of the famous hymn, Come Thou Fount, the author identified it perfectly. We are prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. And what's his answer to that problem? He says, take my heart, Lord, Take and seal it. Because we know the answer is not in ourselves, but only in him. Fourth, the fourth thing that we need to do is repent. All sin has the same solution, repentance. Turn from your sin, seek the face of God. Hear the gospel message and receive it for the good news that it is. 
You, O sinner, are guilty before a righteous and holy God. You rightly deserve his punishment. We're all guilty of placing things ahead of him. We're all on the verge of idolatry at any given moment. Because we are so short-sighted, we think the pleasures of this world are where it's at. Thankfully, in his great mercy, God provided a way for you and I to avoid the eternal consequence of sin. Jesus lived a perfect, sinless life. He died a death he didn't deserve so that all who trust in him would be pardoned and receive eternal life. He bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might live to sin, or we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Romans 8.1, and I think this is, this is really the theme of Scripture. If there's one verse you want to memorize, it's this one. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. The answer is that for us, in understanding God's word and his purpose, God has given us his law to know his holy will, but also to show us our sinfulness. And as soon as that law has done its work, the gospel comes in to rescue us, to give us that life-saving message that takes us from death to life. While we're here on this side of the grave, we're called to be God's ambassadors. This means that our primary citizenship is not as Americans. Our primary citizenship is that of Almighty God and His kingdom. We have been commissioned to this foreign land to give the King's words to those who dwell here. That's our job. He's commissioned us to give his words to people who dwell here. We're called to show them his holy law. We're called to warn them of the coming judgment. We're called to call them to repentance, to turn to Jesus Christ. But in the midst of this, we're also called to show them compassion, to show them love, to show them grace. I pray that we seek to live out this mission daily. I pray that in the middle of this weekend, when we spend time as we ought to, thanking God to live in this great nation, that we don't end it there, but that we also pray for our unsaved friends, families, neighbors. We pray that God will grant us the strength, the courage to step out in faith, to show them God's love. Because as we do that, he will be honored. And he will use that to bring many to himself. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, it is a great joy to live in this great country. But help us to understand that, that you are sovereign over this nation as well. You have decided what is going to be the end of it. And the fact remains that as great as, as this nation is, it is not the answer for the world's ills. The world all of us suffer from a spiritual problem. And the only answer is found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Help us to understand that and help us to go forth with that message of salvation to those who need it. Help us to meditate on it because the fact is we need it, Lord. Thank you for your amazing grace and mercy. May we glorify you in all we do, Lord. Amen. I want to invite the uh, praise team to come up who's going to lead us in our final hymn.